uh, uh, letter of credit has a limit in duration. Very often it is six months. Um, but it can be, can be longer, can be shorter, but the standard validity is six months. Um, and now, uh, during the, uh, the production and the supplier's side starts, eventually there will be also um, intermediate uh, tra trades and uh, uh, property changes um, because there might be an export house switched in between, a trading house in between. So there are a number of possibilities um, that time uh, will be uh, consumed, specifically then when production has to be undertaken, uh, tech, tech, which of course is a technical process. So what can happen is that these six months letter of credit duration uh, could be running short, or they can, they can be coming into shortness of a, resi a, resi a residual time. And the effect is um, uh, the supplier, the exporter, he needs the bill of lading from the shipping line as proof that his export that has been ordered has been loaded on the ship on a very specific day. And this specific day of loading on board of a ship must be before the expiry of the letter of credit. And now, when he has got the bill of lading in his hand, the exporter, then he can go to his export exporter's bank, house bank, that is his own, his own bank, present the bill of lading, present uh, his letter of credit, and then collect the money for the export value. Mm -hmm. But uh, if the bill, uh, the bill of lading shows a date after the expiry of the um, of the letter of credit, then the bank will say, sorry, letter of credit is expired. You have to start the whole business from the scratch. Uh, uh, for, for instance, apply for a prolongation of the letter of credit, but pro prolongation of the letter of credit requires that the, the importer who has opened that letter of credit has to agree to that. Uh, but that is not guaranteed that he will agree. Uh, he might have changed his, uh, his mind in the meantime and say, so, well, okay, the price was a bit, bit high. Uh, I, I agree to a, to a prolongation only if you give a very substantial rebate. Uh, then I agree. Has all happened already. Uh, but um, uh, the result of the whole thing is and as a shipping line, you are and as a port, of course, also, you are completely aware, aware of that problem. Um, if a book cargo or planned cargo uh, fails to get a certain ship, a very certain ship of a certain week, can, res can, can easily result that the, that the delay uh, results in, a, in the expiry of the corresponding letter of credit. And that is uh, close to a really uh, serious disaster uh, if that happens. Because all, all these um, measures they need to be repeated and uh, the importer could come to the idea uh, to ask for whatever kind of uh, of uh, commitments and uh, rebates or whatever uh, payments, uh, payment of of uh, damage compensation or whatever. So uh, everybody in this business uh, has a very strong, uh, very strong uh, motivation uh, not to exceed uh, uh, the expiry date of letter of credit. Uh, with the departure date of the ship. So, and ports and shipping line know that perfectly well. And the, the ability not to let that happen is also one of the quality criteria. And of course, also, if you have a depa one departure every week, in some cases even two or three departures every week, uh, that is because of that.
that aspect is a very strong uh, quality element of your services. And uh, a, uh, an exporter who knows that his port has made it already, or the shipping line correspondingly, has made it already several times possible. It's calling here. Um, uh, has made it already several times possible to keep uh, the date, uh, expiry date for the letter of credit, uh, then they have reasons to think that this port or this shipping line is very reliable and uh, other shipments that may, may be also critical as well will be easily given to that well-tried shipping line and well-tried port also. So we see here, uh, of course, we need to have in every port an overview uh, who exactly uh, in one year uh, has been uh, shipping uh, when, when, how much. So an example we have here, here we have the clients, these are all shipping lines, and uh, we have here on this, here is the, the full, full name of the clients. Here we have the, uh, uh, the end, end of year projection, and here we have the, the, the full number. Uh, of course, one starts to keep uh, to, to produce the same uh, already in the first uh, months of the year, January. So uh, every other completed month, uh, you add this. So here you have the projection, and at the end of the year, the projection is uh, identical with. Uh, Identical, uh, then there must be a reason for that. This year is for year 2006 for Jeddah, Jeddah Islamic port for the South Container Terminal. Uh, so you have an, an idea uh, who is the most important customer. Here we see it at 32%, that is Mediterranean uh, shipping company, well known. You see their containers everywhere. Second largest after Maersk. And Maersk was on the North Terminal, and uh, so you we are well advised uh, to keep good relationships to the shipping line representatives of your port. Usually, uh, at each of these shipping lines has an office in your port, and you will find also in uh, ports like Simaran, uh, Surabaya, of course, obviously in Tanjung Priya you will find offices of all these shipping lines if you produce uh, such an overview. Uh, so, uh, you, uh, one important measure of marketing is uh, producing, say, a monthly client data where you inform as a journal the monthly update can be uh, by email, but it is nicer if it is a print. Uh, paper uh, sent to all these offices of the shipping lines, uh, all the, uh, reporting all the news in addition to your annual report that is published uh, uh, year by year. So this uh, client letter, of course, should be prepared by the marketing department of the port, simply to keep everybody informed. So every every thing of importance that happens in the, in the port uh, can, be, can be addressed in this uh, client letter, which is a quite important tool uh, for, for, mark, uh, for marketing and strategy, marketing strategy also. And of course, uh, what you also can do is uh, regularly visit every office, every uh, Every of these uh, representatives uh, by a small but high ranking delegation from your board, general manager, for instance, or uh, uh, chief operating officer, or something, together with the marketing officer, to sit down together, uh, talking whether there are problems, uh, whether there are wishes, uh, these, uh, ideas that could be leading to improvement, and Sometimes one is also 
talking about uh, confidential rebates. And uh, that can also happen. After all, uh, each port has a tariff, uh, and uh, we have mentioned that already. Uh, but uh, high frequency users, like uh, for instance, MSC is. Um, certificate. 
applications and agreements and make all sorts of payments before with a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, reception uh, receptions you can go to the port and claim this cargo. That is very uh, uh, annoying and cumbersome for the importer. That can easily uh, motivate him to use another port. So what is heavily recommended is organizing uh, a one counter desk or one counter office, so to speak. It could be a, a small office building where everybody in the concern in the port has an own office. It starts of course with the office the offices of the of the shipping lines, all office uh, of all shipping lines representative in the port, and the customs, because very often you need the the uh, the, uh, the giving free of the or the okay from the customs when you have paid your customs fees and other taxes, so you must produce the reception that you have paid that. Uh, but if you have to, to travel the port, uh, the, the entire city back and forward to all different places to collect all this, that would be terribly cumbersome for the client. Uh, the client is a king. Uh, so have a thing in one building, uh, uh, middle of medium size, but small size will not go there. So there would be quite a number of offices there. So you'd be, you only need to go from one office to the next. There would be also sanitary offices uh, 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 where, you, uh, where you need to, to get uh, confirmations that, uh, that your product is healthy and, and uh, uh, can be freely imported without, uh, without that there is no, no ban on it you know, uh, from any uh, uh, sanitary and food or, uh, uh, prescriptions that might be might be in force. Uh, so, and of course, very important uh, two or three uh, bank terminals where you can make the appropriate payments uh, and also not, not to run around in the whole uh, township. So, if, uh, if that is so, if you, have, if you can offer that uh, uh, one, uh, one stop office uh, building, uh, then uh, the importer can complete all the formalities uh, in one half a day, maybe even just a few hours, two hours or so. Uh, of course, you need a parking spot, so it often, uh, usually it does not come with a bicycle or so it comes with a car. Uh, and uh, uh, you need also to have some amenities for customers, a, caf a cafeteria or so, where you can sit down and uh, have a coffee while he is waiting for this and for that. Sometimes they are meeting, having their own sorts of meetings. Uh, <coughs> so these are all measures uh, that have something to do with marketing. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, there will be then also, um, uh, uh, in some cases, market uh, customs inspection of uh, what you have there. In, Saudi Arabia, that is particularly uh, important because there are many, uh, many commodities that are banned for import. So banned, for instance, is everything that has something to do with Israel. Uh, banned is all sorts of drugs, alcoholic beverages, anything that has something to do with pork. Uh, it, it was even, I'm a hunter. And in Germany, we are hunting also bush pig. And I had a, was some, I was gifted sometimes a carpet with a depiction of a bush pig on the carpet. And I had a carpet with me, and it was seen by the, uh, by the customs. And they said, What? Uh, you have a carpet with a bush pig? No, that is not Islamic, not allowed, See, uh, not allowed for entry. I had to throw it away, which I uh, regretted very much because it was a gift from a very good friend of mine. And, uh, but then sometimes customer has a trend for uh, exaggeration. So uh, what bad would the customer with a, with a bush pick on it uh, have for, for, for wherever? No, none. You could 
is even use it as a as a as a prayer garment. And uh, okay, uh, that that all can can happen. Uh, so uh, if you can motivate the customs in your port uh, not to over exaggerate uh, what what that task is, uh, then it, that would be also very helpful. And uh, uh, in some ports, really, the customs can be a menace for the proliferation of the port when they then uh, do their duty in uh, quotation marks uh, too harsh and too, too stringent and specifically too time, too time consuming. For instance, uh, many ports have already established X-raying of containers. That goes very fast, but frequently it turns out X-raying is not enough. Still, the container needs to be opened, uh, cargo out, uh, and then grappling every, everywhere around uh, to, uh, in order to search whether there is something ill illegal. The container, and uh, I can tell you one thing. Uh, early this year, March, April, I was in Ecuador uh, with this shrimp farming business, uh, with their 50,000 tons of shrimp export a year, with uh, between 15 and 20 uh, 40 foot reefer containers every day. And, uh, they made ready, so I advised them. Uh, you cannot fill the containers anyway because you have a weight, cargo weight limit of 22 tons. We could, uh, I could show you ways uh, where you could get even uh, 28 or more tons into a 40 feet container uh, by different stacking of, uh, of the containers. But this is also not uh, advisable, for, first because of the 22 ton limitation and second, even more important, um, if you stack that as you are, as you are doing, uh, the containers, uh, so to speak, from the pallet into the, into the container without pallet, uh, then um, imagine the container arrives somewhere where they have a, a strict uh, customs inspection. They will, in the, the, whole, the, the whole consignment, deep frozen at 80 minus 80 degrees. Then they will unpack everything, eventually the tropical condition, and your product, uh, your export product that was supplied in excellent deep freezing condition, will warm up uh, uh, because uh, all the cartons will be stacked in front of the container, and then they haven't found anything. Uh, obviously, they would not pack anywhere uh, drugs in it, despite it is Ecuador. Uh, they would never do that. Uh, they would not allow that. Um, but uh, that can lead to a temperature temperature damage uh, when the customer finds out uh, that the, his valuable shrimps were uh, partly thawed up because of the customs inspection. Customs will certainly not pay for that. For that damage. So um, make do it like this. Uh, get yourself cheap, uh, inexpensive one-way pallets uh, and put them on the one-way pallets uh, and leave them on the uh, uh, one-way pallets. It means not only loading goes faster, uh, then customer customs inspection will be also way faster because customer will then uh, use. Uh, forklifts to take several pallets out, mostly not all of them out, but just some of them out. Look around, something irregular, no, okay, with forklift pallets back, and that goes just in a few minutes uh, and finish, and uh, the container can go, uh, no temperature that, uh, claim possible. If that can be conduct, uh, done, say 50 minutes and all, all is completed. So highly advisable not to stack carton by carton uh, down from the, uh, after all the cartons were brought along on pallets by, uh, by forklift, but the pallet was 
got not loaded into the container because they thought the pallets are way too valuable, but you can get also one cheap, uh, inexpensive one-way pallets, uh, that is a uh, pallet that is not supposed to come back, that can be used at the, uh, at the, uh, at the importer's place as firewood or what, what, whatever, if it is made from wood. Uh, they are also available from, from plastic, uh, so it's not, not, not expensive, at least uh, not of much relevance for, for a high-value project like frozen ships. There you should really have the money left uh, to give some inexpensive one-way pallets and, and to avoid, and thus to avoid, a temperature claim. Uh, okay, all these me measures have also an, an element of, um, of marketing because uh, a buyer and importer will see, okay, uh, they have been using lots of, uh, of of uh, professional uh, measures and precautions to protect my cargo. Uh, that is always very well seen by important by clients in the widest sense and gives them motiv motivation next time to come again. Uh, uh, so <coughs> um, these, these are things uh, that one can, uh, of course, as a port, you can see uh, how the customs uh, is stripping containers just only for checking uh, uh, for checking for illicit uh, element, <coughs> elements in the container, and you can advise uh, your customers, uh, be that the shipping line or be that the, the, the exporting. Uh, that if you put everything in one way containers, this would be going way faster with less risk of uh, pilferage and damage and uh, you will save, uh, on the end of the day, you will save a lot of money despite the comparatively small cost of a one way, of a number of one, one way container, uh, one way uh, pallets. All this can be summarized under, uh, under uh, marketing. And of course, another important aspect is uh, dangerous cargo. Most dangerous cargo, IMDG code, uh, is, is the, 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 uh, the adversary property that every subsequent port behind, uh, behind the next port behind the port, next to your port, um, will ask for a dangerous cargo list from, from all uh, car dangerous cargo on that ship, from different shipping lines on, on, on one single uh, ship. And then they will go through it and will say, okay, this commodity maximum uh, in one ship only so and so much is allowed. This commodity is not at all allowed. So they refuse the entire ship. Uh, that, that is what certain uh, harbor masters would do. Uh, dangerous cargo is not the question of customs, it's more the harbor master. Uh, the harbor master is not belonging to the, to the, um, to the commercial uh, port operators. Uh, so it is most advisable to know that all, all these uh, details, to know them before, beforehand, what are the limitation, quantity limitations, and what exactly is completely banned. What mostly is banned is um, radiating cargo, uh, nuclear radiating cargo. Uh, I mentioned that story already before, uh, what we did in, in one of these cases. <coughs> so, uh, whenever you receive the booking, of IMDG, dangerous IMDG code, uh, code cargo, uh, you need to, uh, to, to uh, collect the, uh, the approval from all subsequent ports, including uh, the ports in the, in the other uh, continent, that is the destination ports, you need to collect their approval uh, from all of them that 
this and this booking is okay. okay. Somebody comes comes late with his booking and his uh, his cover his consignment uh, would exceed exceed the quantity limitation, then you can tell him already at an early stage that uh, his uh, that the quantity limitation for that commodity is exceeded and that he should better uh, plan now already for the next ship because this ship will be really in trouble if they come with a, with a dangerous commodity with exceeded uh, quantity limitation. Uh, that would be even a worse uh, scenario uh, than, uh, than uh, putting it on one ship then later and eventually uh, deleting, uh, deleting the, the expiry of, of a letter of credit. In such a case, if that is a response, um, when, when he comes back, if I put it on the next ship, uh, my letter of credit will expire, <coughs> then you have a problem, but uh, maybe you can shift somewhere else. That makes the quality of the book uh, uh, calm and energy. Or should be like as the case may be. So um, all these are things that uh, need to be um, considered, and uh, it is uh, a sign of quality um, that somebody who books an IMDG commodity consignment uh, to give him within a short period uh, the approval, hopefully the approval. Very rare cases, unfortunately, could be also a denial. Um, but most of the time, there will be an, an approval. But this approval as fast as possible, uh, and then the whole thing dispatched without problems. That is also a token of um, of quality. I, for instance, uh, was for a considerable period in the 70s. Uh, the, uh, cargo manager for OOCL in Hamburg and uh, my strategy was um, to attract as much as possible uh, IMDG cargo and uh, out of gauge cargo that is uh, oversized cargo to my ships of OOCL and because the, the main reason for doing that is the tariff for uh, such cargo is a lot higher than ordinary cargo that has no dangers, no out of gauge size, and nothing, no problem at all. So um, if you come with specialities, albeit either high value, electronics for instance is high value, or machinery is also high value, or dangerous chemicals is also, also high value, uh, namely because of these uh, IMDG Cautions. and of course uh, out of gauge consignments. So I specialized on that, offering a particularly fast and reliable service uh, to our customers and that was um, also uh, acknowledged by the customers and you could see that uh, on our monthly uh, analysis of uh, revenues per TU that we had. The, point, the, the outcome was then, I could present to my management, to my top management, our OCL consignments was this month, month's average revenue per TU was this month $2,400 per TU, per one TU, per, in, per, in the average. And our competitors, for instance, Hapag Lloyd, theirs, uh, that was um, published then uh, internally in our uh, trade conference, um, they were only at $1,500 per TU. And that was so months by month by month, year by year. Because the strategy behind, we were focusing on the high tariff in cargo, meaning uh, IMDG cargo, uh, out of gauge cargo, and in line with that also electronics and machinery. And Upper Cloyd, they had in their containers uh, all sorts of cheap, cheap, uh, low tariff commodities. They 
ended up at around, at always at around $1,500 per TU. Uh, and we, between $2,200 and $2,500 per TU. This was in the 70s. Nowadays, shipping lines would dream of such uh, results. Uh, as well, uh, these times are long gone. But still, uh, from the port side of you, uh, you have seen the, the internal rates of return that are possible in, from the port side. It is still a very lucrative uh, business. And back in the 70s, it was even more lucrative. Okay, uh, doing all of this, uh, uh, specializing on uh, uh, on uh, difficult, high-tariff commodities, for instance, that are marketing strategies and business strategies also. Uh, you can show your competitor uh, what it is all about. Interest, uh, 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 interesting in that case, I started my seafarer co uh, career as a mariner with Harper Lloyd. Uh, so later on, uh, I, I was with their competitor uh, Oriental, uh, Oriental uh, Overseas Container Line and uh, show, showing them how uh, we could uh, organize uh, to the, oh, well, well above $2,000 uh, per TU in the Far East trade, outgoing, uh, uh, eastgoing, uh, and they would be in the same trade uh, at the same time only with $1,500. So that gave me very frequently a high level of, of, of satisfaction, you know, showing my former masters uh, what their what their uh, what their trainee had learned. And, um, always the same video. Uh, <coughs> okay, uh, this all belongs uh, to it. So and one other important uh, or some significant thing is what you can do is uh, you can invite uh, your key customers uh, they, have, they have always trainees both on board of their ships and also in their offices you can invite uh, propose to your key clients that they can send their trainees for internships to your port be it just a few weeks or maybe it a couple of months as they need fit. And uh, of course you will not use these uh, uh, trainees for all sorts of heavy and dirty work. No, uh, uh, they, they are supposed to learn something in your port and how everything is functioning. As to, as to that, uh, I can tell uh, Funny story from Hamburg, also from OCL. OCL, uh, as everybody knows, is Chinese from uh, from Hong Kong, um, and uh, the head office is in London. And uh, upon our invitation, they sent, in fact, uh, every couple of weeks, one could even say, they sent in groups of uh, not only trainees but also. Uh, normal employees for uh, internships to, to our port of Hamburg. And their motivation, of uh, they, they were all Chinese. Their motivation, uh, their personal motivation, was not so much uh, to see our container terminals, uh, we had several there, uh, altogether there are there at the time being three uh, uh, container terminals in Hamburg. Um, we were on the, uh, the Euro uh, Their motivation was not so much to see our container terminal, despite it, would, it was very worthwhile to see, but that was not really their interest. Their interest was predominantly to go to the Ripperbahn, that is the uh, red light district in Hamburg. Yeah, it is so. <laughs> we, we discovered that very early that that was the true, the true motivation uh, and why we were their very best friend, friends uh, because we could, we could materialize that demand uh, but uh, on the other hand side uh, we said okay uh, that goes too far uh, 
friendship is good, uh, but not guiding them into the red light uh, district. But you cannot, uh, you cannot say, no, we don't do. One has to do that in a more sophisticated way. And um, uh, my top managers trusted me with that task. After all, I had was many, very many things that uh, had to be arranged in, in many aspects. So what I did was, yes, very good idea, we can go. Uh, after we have completed here our office exercises. But first, before we go to the Ripperman, Rip that is the official name of that area, um, before we go to the Ripperman, um, we first go for dinner. After all, it makes like, uh, to eat something reasonable before, because it has also something to do with drinks. Chinese are no Muslims, they have no problem with drinking beer and whatever other alcoholic beverages. So we went into a typical German specialty restaurant and eating pork and whatnot. Chinese also have no problem of eating pork. And uh, uh, all, all our companies, uh, our companies build. And then uh, I ordered also uh, one style uh, 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 beverage container after the other of beer and also spirits. Uh, as I said before, no Muslims, Chinese, they, uh, they drink that. As a result, uh, they have a lack of a certain enzyme. That means after very few drinks and glasses, they are completely drunk. And uh, so I ordered a taxi and, uh, to come told the taxi driver, gave him my business card, telling him to bring, bring these three guys uh, to their hotel, uh, send me tomorrow your taxi bill, the cleaning bill for the taxi, uh, send it to my office, we'll tell you then. Uh, and they went off and to their hotel, uh, and I could return home, and uh, no need to go there to, to, the, to the river bar. And that was way, way cheaper, and because, uh, company was expected to pay for that on the river run. Uh, so uh, we, we were getting uh, nicely away with just uh, the dinner bill, which was uh, still modest enough. Uh, so the, the, the next noon, they showed up again. In, in the morning, uh, they couldn't, they were still sleeping, uh, showing up. And then, what, what, what has happened with you? We wanted still to go to the river bar. You, you could not even respond to my to my proposals. Yeah? And uh, yeah, uh, maybe it was a bit too much. Yeah? But today we go to the river river bar. Yes, of course we will. But first we go for dinner. So I repeated the whole thing, the whole procedure like the preceding day, and exactly the same thing happened again. Sent them completely drunk back to their hotel. Yeah? And. The, the next day, the third day, even, and, and then the whole thing ended. And they were only there for a few, just a few days, not not for an extended uh, thing. So, uh, last message I gave them along is, okay, when you come next time, then we go to the to the river and look at <laughs> So there was coming one group after the other, so to speak, one group every month, and this procedure or this strategy worked every and every time. Uh, instead of going to the Ripperman, we went to, to a dinner restaurant, uh, made them completely drunk, sent them back to the hotel, and uh, uh, good it was. Uh, not, nothing to the Ripperman. Uh, no, none of our Ch Chinese uh, uh, or we call a our Chinese principles, you can have to say, uh, I was, ever saw the, the river bar from the inside. Uh, and uh, uh, that is also a uh, 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 marketing strategy. Uh, take, taking your customers to, uh, to dinner is okay. Very, very nice idea. Uh, guy taking him for an internship is also a very good idea. Uh, but taking them to the river bar that goes too far. That is that is not so much in the in the in the uh, array of, of services, uh, and uh, 
had another funny experience uh, with uh, two tradies uh, from Saudi Arabia who, who were obviously uh, Muslim. You know? And um, they came, that was in the year 1981. It was uh, a year where the, where the uh, Ramadan was falling into June. And Hamburg is relatively far in the north. There uh, in June, the, uh, the sunrise is already around 4 o'clock in the morning, even before, before that. After all, you know, you are all Muslims, you know uh, the criteria for, for sunrise is when you can differentiate the uh, white feather from the black feather when it is day. Uh, so, in the moment that the, 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 the dusk is so uh, that you can differentiate the white from the black feather, then, okay, uh, fasting has to start. And in the evening, the other way around, as long as you still can differentiate black from white feather, you, you are not allowed to eat. But, uh, at, in June, in Hamburg, so far in the north, this would be around uh, 3 o'clock something, in the morning. And in the evening, it would be around 11 o'clock in the evening. Uh, and all of this time, they are not allowed to eat or to drink, and also not to smoke. And uh, at that time, this uh, fatwa of uh, smoke prohibition was not yet in place. I, I mentioned that already. Uh, <coughs> so after a, a few days, uh, they came to me and uh, sorry, we, we have to, to, to stop that internship. We haven't been eating for, uh, for so and so many days uh, because uh, they were accommodated in a pension. Uh, because in the early morning for breakfast, uh, before uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, we were not getting breakfast. You know? And in, in the evening, after 11 o'clock, the kitchen is also closed. You know? So we haven't been eating for a long time, only drinking water uh, during this night period. Uh, cannot stand it anymore. I said, okay. I must admit, yes, of course, that is why we have that problem. Okay, do you know the Quran? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, and do you know who exactly is committed to fast during, uh, during uh, Ramadan? Well, uh, they had a rough idea do not. Okay, I tell you something. Travelers are not obliged to fast during Ramadan. And are you travelers? Uh, yes, we are travelers. But we don't believe you. You are, you are a non-believer. What do you know about the Quran? Maybe more than you, more than you think. Um, I give you an address, a telephone number, that is one of the Imams in Hamburg. We have a, a considerable community of Muslims in, of Islamic organizations in Hamburg. Uh, this is one of the chairmen. Uh, you call him and ask him uh, whether you as travelers from Saudi Arabia are accepted from fasting in the current uh, Ramadan. And I'm sure he will tell you that you are not committed to do that. Uh, so they did, they called him. Of course he confirmed, yes, you are a traveler. Uh, you need to, to uh, postpone, you can postpone your fasting after you are back. Saudi, Saudi Arabia, but as long as you are here, you don't need to fast. And they were very uh, relieved of that message uh, that, that, that they could uh, eat and drink during Ramadan because they were travelers. Uh, and uh, the only thing that, uh, that it was just a, 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 a kufa like me who told, told them uh, that. Uh, that they could eat and drink. Okay, that, 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 that are all experiences that one can bear in mind. Uh, so if you have, uh, if you have Islamic customers, uh, you can advise them also uh, what to do. The least thing is, of course, to tell them where exactly uh, the Qibla is in your port. They also don't, don't know that always. Sometimes they know that belongs also, belongs everything
to market strategy and, uh, and business planning. Uh, and uh, but they were usually not in the condition 
to uh, to uh, uh, to guarantee the the quality level that the FESC members could could do because they had a, a lot of cooperation aspects not only with respect to a common tariff but also with respect to other common services uh, and this was uh, the case uh, from 1869 so to speak uh, opening the uh, the, the, the Suez Canal until around the uh, around the year 2000 I'm not quite sure what, uh, which exact uh, year that was when the EU Commission as one important factor on the eastern side of that uh, on the western side of that uh, trade uh, uh, prohibited the, uh, the, the, the sea freight conferences saying that this is an obstacle to free competition. Nobody should be, uh, uh, should be allowed to form cartels and such a sea freight conference is nothing else than a cartel. And so they were prohibited. Uh, everybody is now, uh, every shipping line is now free to calculate their own tariff or the level of uh, freight rates. And um, one uh, aspect is now uh, that many shipping lines say, okay, um, this uh, tariff open uh, that we had in the past, specifically of the FDFC, also now prohibited. Um, was very complicated, so making a correct calculation of, CFRA, of a CFRA bill was a very cumbersome business. And it had to be uh, all these, all these um, bill, uh, uh, these, these, uh, these uh, customer bills had, had to be first given to the local FEFC uh, office for approval. And when you receive the approval, then you could launch these uh, bills uh, to, the, to the customer for, for payment. And, then, and, and when they found somewhere a uh, violation of the tariff undercutting the FEFC tariff with something, uh, then you could, as a shipping line, uh, get a, a fine, a financial fine. Uh, and that could be a very hefty fine uh, that could easily exceed the, the revenue from that specific uh, from that specific commodity, uh, the income from that specific com commodity. And of course nobody likes that. One had to, um, uh, to, to put many, a lot of effort in the extremely correct calculation of the F FEFC tariff. Um, on the other hand side, because the results of every shipping line member of the FEFC uh, was published, so everybody knew from everybody else uh, how much cargo he had shipped and how much uh, revenue per TEU he had uh, earned from these shipments and also the total revenue of course also and that was why it was possible for me to see, okay, we make here 2,200, 300, 400, 500 dollar per TEU my former employer, Abad Lloyd, was making only 1,500, uh, which gave me additional satisfaction, of course. And, uh, um, but this was the time of the FEFC. But nowadays, since approximately 2000, this is pro prohibited. Uh, so most companies, shipping lines, have decided to say, okay, for us, it is indifferent what is inside the cargo. Uh, whether it's valuable or not, uh, we charge one uh, lump sum per TU for stop period. Okay, this has of course the disadvantage uh, that a, a large number of low value cargo uh, can now no longer be shipped uh, 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 economically in a container because uh, with one uniform lump sum freight rate, uh, per TU, and no, giving no consideration of what is inside and how much is inside, could be half empty or quarter empty or completely full one one single lump sum freight rate. Um, that mean that means, of course, having this advantage that low valued commodities can no longer be economically ship, shipped in a container because the uniform freight rate for them would be too high. 
On the other hand side, if you have a um, high-valued commodity, for instance, a, a container full with cartons with TV sets, very valuable. Uh, but the, the freight rate for that, compared with the, with the value of the, of the commodity it, as a percentage, is very low. Uh, you can take it as a, as a rough idea in the average, um, the freight rate in the Far East trade is approximately 8% of the total value of the contents of a container. Uh, that is uh, a, 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 an average uh, relationship. 8% of the contents of the total value of a container content um, is the share of the sea freight uh, transport cost. 8%. But that means if you have a highly, highly valuable commodity, then the share of the sea freight may be just 1% or less than that. And if you have a very low value commodity, then it can be easily 20, 30, 40% of that low value. And that can, be, uh, can make low value uh, commodities very freight transport sensitive, uh, that is the professional term for that, where you have a, arrive at a situation where the value of a, uh, of a cargo uh, is, can be strongly affected uh, by the cost of transport uh, and that happens when, uh, when a commodity has not a high value and this is also the reason why we still have um, uh, bulk carriers. The cargo of a bulk carrier is usually that low in value that you will never transport it in a container. Technically it would be possible, but not economically, not financially. It would be not making sense. But there is a lot, a lot of commodities that are just somewhere at the borderline between them in terms of their value. Uh, whether to transport it in containers or whether to transport in a bulk carrier or in a break bulk general cargo ship. We still have some. And um, uh, also you have the, the eventual possibility uh, that uh, the trade, the specific trade is not balanced. That means outgoing you have more cargo than in, incoming. That is, for a typical example, is the, the Far East trade from Europe. Um, the containers from the Far East to, uh, to Europe are always full. Then you have only a very small number uh, of empty containers, mostly none, none at all. Uh, if you have some, then there is certainly some special circumstances behind it. But uh, going east, uh, going eastwise, approximately one third of all containers are empty because there is not more, uh, there is not uh, uh, so much cargo going eastwise, uh, going to, from Europe to Far East that could fill all the container in the opposite directions. That means you have a certain number, approximately one third of containers east going are empty. So you would come, of course, say, okay, they, these containers are empty anyway, so we can uh, fill them with something cheap, with a bulk cargo. Uh, but uh, that happens from time, uh, from time, time to time. Uh, that is, uh, uh, so to speak, either called special commodity quotation uh, or uh, other terms uh, where you get, where you have. Uh, where you uh, use uh, sub-tariff, uh, even from the point of view from your own uh, company, uh, a tariff way lower uh, than, than your official tariff, because simply to fill up uh, containers that would be traveling empty, uh, empty anyway, so before you let them em uh, travel empty, you put any kind of cargo in it uh, for a very, very cheap tariff, uh, very cheap freight rate, uh, so uh, that you have uh, 
at least a, a small contribution to your uh, to your uh, revenue bill. So, um, uh, having said this, um, we have now uh, the situation um, that uh, a lot of cargo uh, can no longer be uh, transported in the container uh, because of its low value. Uh, and uh, if if you uh, uh, if you use a uniform freight rate uh, for uh, for every TU or so, no matter. Uh, what is in it, in it. The freight conferences, knowing of course, uh, when they still existed, uh, knowing of course of this, uh, of this possibility had been warning for a long time uh, that because that was justifying uh, their existence, um, uh, but that uh, the, the EU Commission overruled these arguments and prohibited them, uh, uh, them anyway. Another um, argument from the side of the uh, freight conferences was that in shipping, uh, the block of the fixed cost is extremely high, more than 80% of the cost of, the, of a ship voyage is, uh, is fixed cost and only something around 20% is variable, variable cost. You know the difference in the, uh, between uh, fixed cost and variable cost and the consequences as that has on a, on a, uh, on a business environment. Um, and this, this, is, um, uh, this is a situation that is not found very often in most businesses. The, uh, the share of fixed cost way lower, lower than 80%. In some cases it is even 90%. Uh, for instance, the largest, uh, the largest uh, cost factor for shipping is, uh, is uh, depreciation for the, uh, uh, for the investment cost. That is a typical uh, uh, fixed cost. Another one is uh, transport of uh, the, uh, the fuel cost. Uh, the, the, for the engines, that is also a fixed block, and the, the salaries of the crew is also a fixed block. And there's only very small numbers of variable cost that we may, for instance, uh, the loading, at the shipping uh, loading of containers, for instance, that the shipping line has to pay, or as far as the shipping line has to pay that. But that is a comparatively small share. Uh, of the total cost. So, uh, when you have now uh, shipping lines under heavy competition between in, uh, each other, and they have always had a tendency of creating over overcapacity. Uh, at the time being, we have also overcapacities with shipping lines. Same like it, we had overcapacities in 1869 when the Suez Canal opened, uh, that created from one day to the next, a huge over situation of overcapacity all over the world in, ship, in shipping ship space. And today we have it also, uh, the, uh, already since a couple of years, uh, because shipping lines were always producing larger and larger container ships. Uh, we are now at, uh, at the current situation, we have container ships with 21,000 TU's capacity. 400 meters long. Uh, that is That sounds impressive, and it is impressive. But it also there's no way to ignore that it creates also overcapacity. Uh, that is so. And um, if you have a situation uh, of heavy competition in a situation of overcapacity, and everybody of that of that has. Uh, a, a situation of 80, 90 percent uh, fixed fixed cost block, uh, and uh, only a very small share of var variable cost. He, he is he will have, have the, uh, um, the tendency to accept freight rates uh, way below uh, to, just to cover the the variable costs 
but only with this very small contribution to the to the fixed uh, fixed cost, and that is for, uh, where economists are strict, strongly warning against. Uh, you must, under all circumstances, um, uh, accept or uh, yeah, accept uh, tariff rates that cover both, namely variable costs plus fixed costs. If you accept tariff rates that only uh, accept uh, that only cover the variable costs and only uh, whatever small or uh, small or bigger uh, larger share, but not the full extent of your fixed cost, then in the long run you are uh, subject to uh, ruin, to, uh, to insolvency. That, uh, that was the argument uh, of uh, trade conferences to say we need to have um, a tariff, a common tariff uh, with tariff rates that cover under all circumstances both variable cost plus fixed cost and residually also a small share uh, margin for, for profit. Yeah. But uh, if we don't do that, we are constantly in a situation where we cover the, uh, the, the variable cost. Okay, if even the variable costs are not, co uh, not covered, then they stop uh, shipping, then they lay up their ships, uh, then, then they park their ships somewhere in the home. But as long as variable costs are covered and only a small share uh, 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 of fixed costs are covered, but not the full amount of fixed block, uh, fixed, uh, fixed fixed cost, then they still have a tendency to continue shipping, but they run on the long way, uh, they will run into insolvency. Always thinking that the times might be improving. And uh, the reason why we have seen uh, a number of uh, shipping lines going already into insolvency, the, the most, uh, uh, most, uh, most well-known is this case of this Korean shipping line, forgot the name, uh, but it's uh, just a few years back that uh, there was a really large Korean shipping line that went into an insolvency, into bankruptcy, and uh, there was a huge disaster for the, for the entire shipping world. They had more than 100 ship, ships uh, roaming around uh, in front of ports, and they were not, from one day to the next, not admitted anymore into ports because ports were afraid that they wouldn't, couldn't pay their bills and their, their port use. Cargo owners didn't receive their cargo that were on board of these ships. That was a huge problem. So this was one of the results of uh, uh, abolishing the sea freight conference system. So that one needs one to know. Uh, that is a subject that is coming up uh, pretty often. It is discussed. Uh, whether or not the sea, sea, the sea freight conference system should not be reintroduced uh, in order to avoid the future such such uh, cases, uh, we have we know now the situation of Thomas Cook. This is a tourist uh, booking company. They went also just a few weeks into ago uh, into insolvency. What? Uh, uh, what problems that has caused. This has nothing to do with ships because they are on aircraft. But with aircraft you have a similar situation of a large uh, uh, fixed cost block and only small variable uh, cost share. And uh, uh, such a disaster uh, that we have with Thomas Cook is comparable to the disaster that we have in shipping when large shipping lines, container shipping lines, uh, run into bankruptcy. So this, uh, this also. I think it was, wasn't it, Hanji was, Hanji was it?
Well, if you if you check the internet uh, uh, about uh, about this uh, this uh, bankruptcy case, uh, it was a, a a huge a huge disaster for the for the for the entire industry, not only for the Hanji, but for many other parties also, specifically also for ports and for their custom clients, uh, for, for their cargo clients. So uh, these are all uh, aspects of uh, marketing and business planning. Uh, we have uh, we have here an argument uh, that the uh, that the sea freight conference system is not all that bad. Uh, I, I, for instance, have been writing uh, my thesis work uh, at the University of Cologne about sea freight conferences and their economic uh, consequences uh, on national economies uh, and the sea trade of a number of countries. And um, my result was uh, positive of, uh, of whether or not uh, there should be sea freight conferences and the advantages were widely overruling the disadvantages. Uh, of course, it is true, uh, the competition uh, between shipping lines is limited to some extent. It is a cartel, no, no question about that, but the specific situation of a very large um, fixed block uh, a fixed cost block compared with a very small variable uh, cost uh, part that is overruling, in my opinion, uh, and also in the opinion of my then professors. Okay, that was long before, that was 1975, uh, the uh, 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 C-Frey conference were prohibited some 25 years later. So at my, my time uh, this, this aspect was still rightly agreed specifically by the shipping lines themselves. And uh, okay, we have now uh, obtained an overview uh, of um, uh, ship business planning and marketing, what we can do. So um, for instance, with um, financial internal rates of return of 20 and more percent, we will certainly have also the funds to invite our customers, specifically the shipping line representatives, from time to time to a dinner party, to a joint dinner party, um, and listen for it also to that, what from their point of view, how they assess their particular markets and to draw your own conclusions uh, how you can support their situation and of course uh, what is also well seen is to invite uh, their tra trainees to in for internships at your, at your place. As said before, not to make the dirty and heavy work in your port, uh, but uh, to learn something. My by seeing what is uh, what it is all about, and to witness your uh, decision making from day to day business, and uh, so uh, most important, of course, also to uh, to have such an overview as is shown here. Uh, only if you prepare on a monthly basis for months and months uh, such a table where you know who is doing what. Um, you can make it, uh, of course, also with more in-depth, with more details. But this is an overview that shows you already uh, who, who is important in your trade and who is not so important in your trade. <coughs> Here one needs clearly to say, uh, we have in, uh, at that time, we had in Jeddah, uh, two important container terminals. This is only for the south terminal. We have also the north north terminal. So actually, they're both competing against each other. So they have completely uh, different customers. Uh, so if you find, for, for instance, somebody here with a low low percentage, by the 
uh, transfer it to Dubai, I mean the customers where they with their customer shipping line disposition. You know. And uh, not physically, but uh, business-wise. You know. uh, and uh, later on, uh, Sianco completely left the business. One reason was uh, when they had tendered for their concession, uh, that, that thing that was only a short number of years before, they had uh, offered themselves a fixed a fix, uh, uh, fix contribution uh, for uh, Saudi Ports Authority of 65% of all their revenues, plus another, uh, yeah, uh, that was 65% uh, of all their revenues uh, in addition to uh, the to the fixed number of, uh, of uh, uh, terminal rent. At 65% of all revenues, that is really much. The North Terminal uh, had only 50% of it for their terminal. We were get, getting the concession agreement for 50%. With 50% they, can, they, can, they, can, they could live. Financially, in terms of business, the North Terminal was way, uh, way better off in the South Terminal. Um, one of the reasons was the North Terminal was paying only 50% of their revenues, but in the Siango and TBA uh, business, uh, 65, a lot more. But they didn't know that at the time of offering, that, that the North Terminal had uh, got their concession for 50%. So 65% was one of the reasons why uh, Siaco decided after a while, no, they were not making money with that, uh, not, not enough at least, uh, and they completely withdrew and Google took over their 90% share of the business that was EPA, EPA. they had now 100% of the South Carolina Center. And, of course, were now they, they, they could afford to pay more than that to the, DB, uh, to, to the Port Authority because it was not their motivation to earn money with that uh, terminal. No, it was their motivation to detract more cargo away from, from, uh, from Jeddah and uh, have it going to Dubai. That was their motivation to take over 100% of the South Terminal, and despite my warnings, uh, the, the Saudi Port Authority ignored my warnings. Okay, now they have been losing a lot, lot of a huge cargo share uh, that was transferred from from Jeddah uh, to Dubai. So the Dubai people, the Emirates, appear to be a lot more intelligent than the Saudis. Uh, okay, that, that is so, and uh, it's already uh, uh, 14 years back, uh, so uh, it is, so, it's not, so to speak, uh, slow for, for 14 years back. So no, no more reason to, but uh, for, for teaching and learning how not to do, to do things, it is still good enough, so to speak. In that case, um, uh, the Saudi Ports Authority, by accept accepting that, um, is still good as a bad example uh, for learning, for, for you, for instance. So that is now that what I want I have to say about uh, business planning and strategic strategic management. I hope that you. Could, could follow me and uh, agree to my statements and we will see whether you, you can make something out of it in your professional future. Thank you very much. Any Anybody questions?
master 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 student in intern quotation. Okay. So that means they knew that all all already good. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, maybe it is our of our topic, but I want to ask you when we want to send a frozen food to export to another to overseas, uh, what we provide uh, in the in how to we uh, how to we send the frozen food to the another country? We must provide the refrigerator of. What you uh, no, the, be, yeah, the best way uh, is participating in trade fairs. Trade fairs are held uh, in all major industrial countries uh, in their numbers, so to speak, uh, uh, in, in a large number of different, different uh, businesses. So uh, in the internet, you can check out where and what, at what time, in which country, uh, trade fairs are taking place, then you decide as an exporter of a, uh, of a, a commodity uh, which trade fairs in other countries are suitable for your range of products. Uh, and then you participate there. And then you may look while participating in such, in such a trade fair uh, who could become your, uh, your uh, sales agent that country or in that continent. Uh, that is an important uh, part of uh, industrial uh, uh, management to arrange for your sales outlet. Uh, most uh, industrial production uh, would not function well if you are uh, limited only on your domestic market. Uh, you will have sufficient uh, uh, scale, uh, of scale effect if you can also export your produce and uh, that of course is by uh, if, you, if you don't have already export contacts of the part of the past is by participating in trade fairs especially that those that, that are dealing with your range of products and there will be also a number of um, uh, of Apartheid and sometimes uh, multi apartheid uh, chambers of commerce. We have here in uh, Indonesia, and I think it is in, uh, for these reasons in the, cap uh, in the capital in Jakarta, we have a uh, Indonesian or German chamber of commerce. So if you have a product of an uh, in industrial product to export, to export, you can also, before, before you participate, the foreign uh, uh, trade fair, which involve, which requires cost, of course, uh, you may first uh, take up contact uh, contact with either the, uh, the Indonesian German uh, Chamber of Commerce that is intended dealing with that, and also the Euro European Commission has also a representative office in Jakarta. That is what, that what you also can, uh, can contact. Uh, contract. Uh, what could be, for instance, uh, most, uh, most attractive uh, could be uh, crustacean fish exports. And uh, uh, that, that can be uh, caught ones, but that could be also breeded ones from, uh, f uh, from fishery, uh, from uh, fish, uh, fish ponds. Also, uh, Indonesia is a very suitable area to do that. I know that from Ecuador, where I've been seeing uh, only this one company that was this, the third largest of the world. That means there's uh, two more, two, uh, two more that are even more large, larger than they were. In the year 2017, they exported uh, bread, breeded shrimp, not. Uh, not wild catches, breeded shrimps for 357 million US dollars. 357 million dollars uh, all over the world. Uh, breeded shrimps. Uh, they had three, three, 
3,750 hectares of fish ponds, of shrimp ponds, and they had 2,500 employees. And every day, uh, the total of export in tons is, was around 50,000 tons of shrimps. And every day, between 15 and 20 uh, 40 foot container, refill containers, we make ready for export. You can imagine it is a huge business for one single company, and there is no reason uh, why that would be not possible in Indonesia also. Also in Indonesia, with these many islands, um, you can establish that also. That, that is just only a side hint. Uh, one of the largest shrimp exporters, by the way, is China. And also a major, major part of the Ecuadorian exports go to China. So in Ecuador, we have been asking ourselves, in the knowledge of statistics, uh, of, of worldwide shrimp exports. So we, uh, we the OMASA, OMASA stands for Operaciones Maritimas, uh, we, OMASA, export shrimps about one third of all our exports, uh, second largest after the United States, uh, goes to China. And China at the same time, at the same time is one of the largest exporters of shrimps and they import shrimps one third of our production which is not small so what the hell why the hell are they importing so many shrimps from us while they are at the same time one of the largest shrimp exporters the only explanation that we have is that the imports from ecuador to a considerable content are re-exported by China, just putting a different label, label on it. So in 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 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, variety it is uh, it is uh, Ecuadorian shrimps, but it is uh, labeled uh, bred in bred in China. Who, who will ever be able to check that? Uh, so it is re-exported. Uh, again now to uh, wherever, wherever their, their, their customers, which they obviously have. Uh, maybe um, the swim from Ecuador is a good condition, a good quality, it's for consume in China, and a bad quality from China, it's export to another country. Well, uh, <laughs> from the quality of uh, shrimp in Ecuador, I had always a very good impression, because I've seen with my own eyes, which uh, hygienic precautions they were taking. That was really large. And what they did not do, at least Omasa did not do it, they did not use any antibiotics and any other pharmaceuticals to support the growth, uh, to the, the growth of the shrimps. The only thing they did was maintaining hygienics, uh, and, uh, keeping everything extremely clean. Uh, and um, disinfect uh, whatever was possible. One problem, by the way, uh, was the herons they had there in large quantities. Uh, if you know what a heron is, it is a, 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 a large white bird. You know them certainly also in, uh, in, uh, in Indonesia, but I don't know the Indonesian name for it. Uh, there, it, it is a large bird, not a seagull, uh, with long legs long back uh, and it likes it loves eating shrimps. So wherever shrimp operations were taking place, be it on the ponds, be it on the in the plant processing plant, uh, everywhere were the herons waiting that they could uh, grab the, the shrimp. Okay, uh, that is not so much the problem that, that they catch some of the shrimp that, uh, that is uh, there around. But the dirt that they, they are producing, that is a problem. Maybe a, a hygienic problem. problem. Uh, there were constantly groups of people around wiping the offal from the heralds away uh, because of the requisite um, uh, hygienic uh, requirements. So I said, okay, uh, there should be uh, some measure 
uh, to get rid of the heroes. Uh, they should go elsewhere. But they can tell me that they could do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I advise them. And at the same time, it is widely known in Ecuador it is prohibited. They are protected by the laws, which is not allowed to shoot them. So I said, okay, uh, uh, but what not is uh, prohibited is to have a vacuum them. So I showed them a hunter also, so I know how to catch birds also, the trap. So I showed them. Uh, how to catch herons in a bird trap, the large one uh, that is multi catching. So you can catch uh, 50 or more herons in one single day. And um, so in, in a large wooden uh, cage, a cage with, with meshes on the side, uh, wire meshes on the side, uh, about uh, around 10 cubic meters of size. Um, so, uh, as, a, as a bait, you use shrimps, of course, so they can enter from the top, but they cannot leave anymore. Uh, so they are inside. And if the, you think you have enough hair rods now, 50 or more, then you look, uh, with a forklift, you load the whole, the whole cage, uh, catching box, okay, load it on one of the trucks, drive it 500 kilometers behind the Andean uh, mountains, the other side to the to the uh, to this uh, uh, Amazonas river system, uh, and there you let them free. Uh, 500 kilometers, they will not find so easy to come back. They, they will stay in the Amazonas basin. Uh, and so, if you do that every day and get rid every day of between 50 of 100 herons, then you will reach sooner or later a situation where your hygienic situation is relieved. Not very much herons are left. And it is at the same time a measure that is not prohibited. We're not killing herons, we're simply evacuating them behind the Andean mountains. That is all what you do. And um, so uh, they, they agreed to it that, that they would do that also. Uh, these are all, all sorts of measures that you can do. And, um, uh, it's also all, all are measures to keep the quality of your shrimp production high. And as I said before, uh, we all had the suspicion that part, maybe more than just a part, of all that export going to China would be uh, relabeled re by the Chinese, re-exported -expor by them uh, along with their own exports. So, uh, if that is so, it is not prohibited. It is, it is free of, uh, well, it is legal to do it. Because as we know, China is uh, a very good quality import in Indonesia. Yeah. So just we know many things, which made in China is not very good quality. Yes, because, uh, Every time we use the things, the products, it's a very fast to break, to cross, to everything. But so we think China uh, export is a very uh, middle quality to another country. But maybe they import the high quality to their consume, to their themselves. Like yeah. Uh, the point that I wanted to make to make is. Uh, if you like eating shrimps, uh, I like shrimps very much. Uh, <laughs> Me too. Uh, you too, of <laughs> course, for good reasons. Uh, after all, you have all the preconditions you need for shrimp breeding. You have it here. All uh, requirements, you have them. Uh, so, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is shrimp breeding already taking place here in Indonesia? Do you know that? Is that so? Yeah, my question is, uh, is shrimp breeding already taking place in Indonesia somewhere? In Kalimantan eventually or in Irianiaia or something? Many places that breeding of shrimp in Indonesia, but I know actually there are no where, where place that 
gimana sih produksi udang paling banyak di Indonesia? Di Cirebon. Di <laughs> gimana Pak? Di mana produksi udang paling besar di Indonesia? In Lampung maybe? In well, Sumatra. Normally, it is so in Ecuador, uh, shrimp export is the second most important export produce after crude oil. And it has long already overtaken uh, banana export. Uh, um, some few decades back, the most important export article or export commodity of Ecuador was banana. Then it was oil discovered. Uh, so uh, very very shortly thereafter, oil was the most important export commodity for obvious reasons. And then um, some 40 years back, they started breeding shrimps. And now, since a couple of years, uh, also the shrimp export has overtaken the banana export. Uh, so shrimp export and every uh, Ecuadorian knows that. You, you will not find uh, any Ecuadorian who has never heard of their trim export. Everybody there knows that. Uh, so uh, I'm under the impression uh, if here you Indonesians uh, ask around, does anybody know something of trim breeding in, uh, in Indonesia, that makes me think that trim breeding in Indonesia, yeah. Indonesia is not yet that far developed. Yeah. But the lobster, you know lobster? Of course. Yeah, yes. lobster. In Indonesia, maybe uh, the place who uh, supply to export is from uh, Sukabumi. Sukabumi yeah, okay. and also Chiamis. Yeah. But lobster is usually wild catches. I have not yet heard that somebody is breeding lobster. So that is most probably uh, wild catches in, uh, lo uh, in lobster ba uh, baskets. Uh, we had a fishing project uh, in Somalia that was uh, in the 80s uh, before the civil war broke out um, and in Kizimayo, also financed by the KFW, German Bank for Reconstruction. So they were receiving processing plants, uh, 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 deep freezing houses, storage, uh, uh, reefer storage, uh, house capacity and also well, I think seven uh, small fishing craft uh, and an important uh, fi fish harvest was uh, lobster, not the spiny rock, uh, not the spiny, spiny rock lobster that how we can know them in Europe, uh, but they were without claws, uh, but large, two different brands, both of them delicious. Um, and we were catching them in baskets also. Uh, and um, that means uh, we make a, uh, this kind of fishery was completely new for the Somalis because the Somalis they are not uh, born fishermen, they are more, uh, uh, more uh, nomadic uh, herdsmen driving the flocks of sheep and goats and camels through, through the desert. They had nothing, not much to do with, with fishing or seafaring, despite their long coastline. And uh, so that was completely new for them to import uh, fishing. And uh, we showed them how uh, to establish um, um, uh, from plastic uh, baskets for catching, uh, for catching these uh, lobsters. And they had problems of uh, to sell the problem uh, the lobsters on their market because they were not very much known. And being all Muslims, uh, they said, "Well, uh, uh, in, uh, in our Quran it is said, you can eat fish provided it has shells. Uh, but lobster has no shells." Uh, uh, and uh, so there were a lot of uh, Somalis saying, "No, oh, that is." Uh, haram from, from the point of view of uh, Islam. Uh, which is su surprising. Uh, the Jews say uh, the fish uh, 
that has no shells is haram, uh, or in that case is not kosher. You know? uh, I was briefly before in Saudi Arabia, and there in the big restaurants uh, in Riyadh and in Jeddah, and so if you go into one of these restaurants, you order lobster, you get it, of course, at a low price, of course, but you get it. Saudis never agree to it that lobster be haram. And they know something about Islam. You know? And um, so I said, okay, uh, if you don't want to, uh, to put it on your own domestic market, I've been just coming, not very long ago, coming from Saudi Arabia, I have my contacts here and there, let's export the, uh, the lobsters to Saudi Arabia. And we did that and uh, received very good prices from them. And then, you see that, would you, would you challenge the Saudis of being not proper Muslims, uh, they know the Quran way better than you do. Uh, and if they accept eating lobster, and they have good reasons to do that, after all, it's very tasty, you know, uh, then, then that is so. Okay, if you don't like lobster because uh, you say uh, it has no shell, that is a point of view of the Jews. Uh, but uh, what, what, what is the Jews' point of view of your concern? Uh, it is far more important than uh, your export market in, in Saudi Arabia. After all, from Somalia to, uh, to Saudi Arabia is not all that far. Uh, uh, so we exported in considerable quantities deep frozen uh, lobster uh, to Saudi Arabia because from the, uh, from the uh, KFW we had received the, the appropriate capacity for deep, deep freezing. So that was a very good business, but then very shortly thereafter, the civil war broke out and all came to a standstill. Very much to my regret. And those fishermen that I had trained in seamanship, and they became pirates. So I, I never knew that I would be training pirates at the end of the day. But I was thinking I'm training fishermen. <laughs> that, that can be a, a, such can be life. And uh, so what I wanted to say is, um, lobsters, uh, I've not yet heard that it is possible to breed lobsters uh, in ponds, like it is possible with shrimps. But if you have lobsters, I assume that they are wild catches in baskets. And one needs to be careful that you don't catch too many, because the recovery rate of lobster is way uh, slower than with shrimps. But um, on the other hand side, if you focus on shrimps, and uh, then um, you, have, uh, you have all the preconditions for shrimp breeding you have in your country. Not everywhere. You cannot breed shrimps on the top of a mountain. Of course not. But you have enough area that is suitable for that. And um, specifically, uh, on many of those remote islands where uh, some Indonesians are reluctant to go there because they think uh, that, is, that this is too far away from main lands uh, such as Java is. Uh, but with the prospect of breeding shrimps, make money with, from shrimp export, the first markets that you have would be even here. Java Island uh, because shrimp is also a favorite food here on Java Island. You can go to, to, uh, to the best restaurant and uh, you can get shrimps without any problem. Uh, but for, a, for a, quite, a, quite an impressive price. Uh, and that is why I'm recommending, okay, uh, I have been also recommending to grow wine on the, on the mountains. But of course, I accept that that would give difficulties with the Quran. You mentioned, by the way, have you checked uh, the Quranic verse, the 16, uh, the, the, the Surah 16, verse 67? Read what is written there. And what I'm saying is, in that Surah, the Prophet has uh, commented that the consumption of wine very positive. So, so.
So just read it, read it, and repeat. But when, when I state something about the Quran, no Muslim will necessarily believe me. But if you read it yourself, you, uh, everybody would believe. This is just, just a hint. Uh, also, wine, wine production uh, could, has nothing to do with ports uh, and shipping. Uh, it's just a, a hint. Uh, with, uh, with wine production, uh, that would be a, also a very uh, good uh, way of, uh, of, of, of earning, of earning uh, money. Same like in Bali. In Bali, they do it because they are. They have a linguistic religion, so they have no prob problem with that. Uh, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, I've not yet seen Bali wine exported outside Bali. At least not in Europe or elsewhere. But in Europe, for instance, we have imports from countries like South America, from South, uh, South Africa, from Australia. Uh, you just name it wherever wine can be produced. We have them imported uh, and consumed also in California, not to, not to forget. And I repeat myself, uh, Indonesia has all the preconditions that you need for wine, for wine production. And of course for shrimp production also. And so you can sit down, eat Indonesian shrimp and drink together with Indonesian wine. It's very, very tasty. Tasty and very uh, national patriotic. <laughs> yes, correct. Today is Friday, and Wednesday uh, will start calling very soon. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> 